Um, I'm not sure which is more nerve-wracking, standing up in front of the Oxford Farming Conference as a, a kid who's lived in London all his life, or coming here uh, uh, in front of you guys. And the only thing I'd say is that that was uh, a COVID interrupted two and a bit years ago. And I've spent a lot of time in the time between on the farms of many people in this room. And I want to start really by thanking uh, the landowning and farming community for the incredible support, both uh, having me on their farms, talking about what's going on, and then sharing their thinking with me, and also quite a large number of you uh, pointing out where the initial drafts of the strategy were wrong and what needed to, to change. I thought it might be useful today to do a couple of things. To start off just by uh, talking about what's in the strategy, what it was for, what it set out to do, uh, and apologies to those of you who heard that before, but I think I'll, I'll spend a short amount of time up front doing that, and then talk about what the political context is now and where we might go from here and what might happen over the next few weeks, few months, and few years, and then hopefully leave uh, a good amount of time for anyone here to ask questions. The, um, the food system, as I pointed out in the strategy and actually at that Oxford conference, is a result of the great uh, triumphs of the past. It is both a miracle and a disaster. And I think it is incredibly important to recognize that before you set about trying to change it. So this chart shows the amount of land in agricultural production from 1800 through to 2020 and then projected beyond the population of the world over the same period and global food production. And after the Second World War, uh, we were in a position where, through the whole of human history, when we had grown our population, which had grown from 1.5 billion to 2.5 over the previous 100 years, we'd simply dug up more land, more or less, to produce more food. After the Second World War, uh, as many of you will know, there were serious concerns about the planet's ability to feed the human beings who would exist. We, it was predicted then that due to sanitation improvements, health improvements, the population of the planet would grow to 9 billion over the next 100 years, and we're at 7.8 billion now. And if you look back at the newspapers at the time, this idea that we might not be able to feed ourselves was front page news. Uh, and what the scientists hadn't reckoned with was the ingenuity of a man called Norman Borlaug and uh, a number of other um, pioneers in the farming system. Borlaug, who many of you will know, had grown up in rural Idaho, uh, he'd seen poverty during the Great Depression. Uh, he had seen food riots. He knew what it was like not to have enough to eat. And during the war, he went out to Mexico to try and solve the food problems they had there. He wrote back to his wife saying how poor the soil was, how the places had clubbed his mind, the poverty, but they had to do something. And what he did, uh, while most people thought he was crazy, was uh, breed a new form of wheat that was resistant to rust, that was short-stemmed, uh, and that was highly productive when mixed with uh, fertilizer made using the harbor Bosch process and modern irrigation techniques transformed the food in Mexico. Mexico went from being uh, a wheat importer uh, when he arrived during the war to being fully self-sufficient in wheat by 1960. And that revolution was replayed in other crops, in maize, in rice, and across the world. And, and today, although it's hard to believe given the stories in, in the newspaper, uh, we are actually, as a species, the quantity of food is not a problem. We produce 1.7 times the amount of food per person, uh, more than we did uh, in 1945. The only times this century where there have been famines were in countries riven by political strife or warfare. It's a problem of distribution, not of production. But this uh, miracle came... Uh, at an extraordinary, and at the time, no one must know it, uh, unrecognized cost. And a, a, one way of explaining quite how much the food system has taken over our planet is to look at the, the total weight of animals on the planet over a period of time. This slide shows the uh, 2.5 million people who lived on the planet in 10,000 BC, the period of stable climate known as the Holocene, during which farming, because climate was stable, became possible. And at the time, they were uh, dwarfed by the population of, of wild animals. This slide shows the situation today. So wild animals, the population of wild animals has shrunk, 
in part due to the, our enthusiastic uh, hunting of megafauna and then the increasing pressure we're putting on wild animals. Uh, in fact, the green circles at the top there are animals kept by humans, horses, cats, and dogs, which weigh almost as much as all of the wild animals in the world today. Uh, people, as I said, increased to 7.8 billion, but the animals that we use to feed people has grown massively. At any time, the animals that feed us weigh twice as much as all humans on the planet and 10 times as much as all the wild animals. And that expanse, uh, extensive use of nature has unsurprisingly caused problems. In fact, it is, the farming system is responsible for many of the world's kind of big, big issues. And if you, this, this is the words of Richard Waite from the World Resources Institute. If you're worried about bi biodiversity loss, food is the biggest single cause. If you're worried about fresh water supply and quality, the food system is the biggest strain on water supply and quality. If you're worried about deforestation, it's food, overfishing, it's food, and climate change, the food system which produces 20 to 30 percent of greenhouse gases is second only to energy systems in terms of causing climate change. And the food system actually is likely to cause its own next crisis, the climate change crisis. So this is a, a map done by NASA, which attempts to predict, and we should be cautious about these predictions because, as we know, complex systems are hard to predict. But this attempts to predict if temperatures rise by 1.5 to 2 degrees, what will happen to the productivity of crops grown in these regions? And what you see here is that northern hemisphere, with more carbon in the atmosphere, and warmer, wetter, wetter weather is actually projected to produce more food, whereas maize and rice in Asia and in the southern hemisphere is uh, projected to be less productive. And every time I look at this uh, chart, it says to me mass migration and warfare. And it's not only the environment that has been impacted. This is uh, a chart which shows all the uh, avoidable causes of, of harm to our health. And you'll see that all of those in, in the future, in purple, are caused by diet. Diet is now by far the biggest cause of avoidable ill health. And not only is that a problem for the people who suffer it, for their family, the logistical issues of dealing some with coronary heart disease, um, people who die of uh, diabetes, losing their family, losing time with their grandchildren, it's also incredibly expensive. The NHS projects now that it will spend more by 2035 dealing with type 2 diabetes, only one dietary illness, than it currently does on all cancers. So the system, the food system, is literally unsustainable. It cannot continue in the way it currently operates. The only question is, can we bring about a transition to a better form of operation before more people die, before the environment is more degraded? And when we started, um, I was kind of told by, I went around and talked to kind of all the experts in these areas and was told to, to take a systems approach. And I asked people what they meant by a systems approach. And uh, this chart was one that was often presented to me, which is uh, called the Foresight Obesity Chart. It, it, it shows all of the causes that lead to obesity in society, from the environment to your genes to your family situation. And um, it's a very clever chart. It must have take, taken a long time to produce. But actually, I think this kind of systems approach, focusing on too many things, is counterproductive. Because you look at that, you think it's too hard, and you give up. It doesn't give you anything to pull against, any traction. The other issue that was constantly brought up was the fact that government is, uh, the, the food system is dealt with by many different parts of government, and they are not aligned in creating a solution. And this is true, uh, and in particular cases, so if you look at trade, for example, the fights between DEFRA and the Department for International Trade, or health, where Bayes and DEFRA might have a different view from the Department for Health, it does cause problems to, uh, to joined up thinking. But it is not in itself the cause of the problems in the food system. The lack of join up in government is something that makes the food system harder to, uh, to improve, harder to change. So what is fundamentally going wrong? We identified two feedback loops that are causing the problems using systems theory. 
One is a, a, what's known as a reinforcing feedback loop, which I call the junk food cycle, which is the fact that our appetite, which is an incredibly powerful driver, um, is programmed to seek out food that is highly calorie dense, rich in sugar, salt, and fat. Uh, and if that food is low in fiber, you can also eat more without being full. And the commercial incentives, therefore, of companies, it is much easier to sell us that food than it is to sell us other food. You know, there is a reason that there are 28 kinds of Kit Kat in the UK, because it's a lot easier to sell 28 kinds of Kit Kat than 28 kinds of kale, because we are programmed to eat that stuff. And what has happened over time is, those two things have reinforced each other. So they've put more money into marketing it and selling it. We've eaten more. They put more money in. We've eaten more. We've got sick. And all the money now, 75 to 80% of marketing money in the food system is, is aimed at this kind of stuff. And if you talk privately to the CEOs, and we might cover this in the Q&A afterwards, they will acknowledge that they are as trapped in this system as we are. They're as trapped as the sick people, because if they speak out about it, I had a, a specific conversation with the CEO, former CEO of one of the big supermarkets last week, who said, if they speak out and acknowledge this, they will be fired by their boards. They want to help change, but they cannot talk about it. And so they are stuck, the food, the food industry, in this problem as much as we are, and we need to try and find a way of breaking that. So that's the junk food cycle. But I want to talk today about the invisibility of nature and the environment, which is... Uh, which is the reason that all of those environmental problems uh, exist. And it was actually, this was pointed out by Partha Dasgupta, the economist who wrote an absolutely brilliant uh, report for Treasury on the, on the economics of biodiversity. And what he pointed out was that nature is not, does not exist in any of the systems that we use to measure human success. You can't count it in your wallet. It's not in the P&Ls or on the balance sheet of companies. It's not in the way we measure GDP. And in fact, it's worse than that. He estimates that governments worldwide spend about $500 billion a year subsidizing activities that destroy nature. Many of those subsidies are in fossil fuels and in agriculture. And that that subsidy destroys uh, nature to the value of about five to seven trillion dollars a year. So not only, we're not, it's not that we're giving nature no cost, we're giving it a negative cost. We're paying people as governments to destroy nature. And nature is uh, also quite hard to measure. Uh, as Das Gupta points out, it's silent, uh, it's largely invisible, and it's mobile. It doesn't respect borders, uh, uh, it doesn't respect most of the ways in which we try to divide up the world. So before you think about, OK, how do we deal with that, you have to ask yourself, what would a food system which recognized nature look like? Now, currently, what our food system largely recognizes as, as valuable is the production of food at a good price. Um, and this is what our land use looks like on a natural level. We use about um, almost twice the amount of our, of our land in the UK to feed us with land abroad. So those hexagons on the right are areas of land abroad that's used to feed us. And on the left is land in the UK. And you'll see at the bottom, you've got peat uh, down in the West Country. Obviously, it's not literally all in the West Country. In fact, most of it's up north. Uh, cereals. And then all the green is uh, animals, either pasture or crops used to feed animals. And tiny amounts um, up in the Shetlands of orchards and fruit and veg, um, slightly dwarfed by golf courses. So that is how we use land uh, today. You then, we asked ourselves the kind of the intellectual question, well, what would happen if we wanted to produce enough food and sequester the carbon that we needed to sequester and uh, uh, bring back biodiversity, increase biodiversity? And uh, if you start with carbon, you actually need to have a net food. The, the land system needs to be carbon negative. It can't just be carbon neutral because there are other industries that will continue to put out carbon, and so we need to suck that in somehow, and we need the land to do that. And if you kind of do this uh, equation, it is actually possible to do those three things. You can map out a system which does that. And in order to do that, first of all, you have to realize that there are different kinds of biodiversity, and there is some biodiversity that likes to live off-farm. In this country, we have an enormous amount of biodiversity 
that likes to live on farm. And you can then map those things against the areas where you can sequester the most carbon. And luckily for us, the areas where there is high carbon sequestration potential are also m quite closely correlated with the areas where there is high biodiversity potential and low food production. So we calculated that you could uh, broadly create the same amount of food in this country uh, while um, sequestering carbon, restoring biodiversity, and that you would need to do that with uh, a model which saw different forms of farming. So you would have, broadly speaking, a small amount of land. 70% of our land is now farmed. We reckoned about 65% would still be farmed. Even of that 5%, you might have conservation grazing. Uh, and, and pasture would still be about 53% of our total land. But you'd have a system where you had more regenerative, less productive areas that were explicitly both restoring nature, sequestering carbon, and producing food. You would have what I know a lot of you here are doing is coming from the other direction, which is taking higher yields and producing those more sustainable, sustainably by using regenerative techniques to reduce the amount of nitrogen, amount of phosphates, and so, so forth that you use, which are higher yielding. And then you would have some areas set aside. Um, and that is possible, but it's possible only if we reduce the amount of food we waste. Uh, and if you define that food wastage more broadly than we normally do. So you have to see food wastage not just as the food that's thrown away at the farm gate or at the supermarket or in the home, but also as the enormous amount of land uh, that we use to grow meat. We reckon you have to reduce meat consumption by about 30%. Um, if you eat meat every day of the week, that's a day a week. It's not a hugely radical thing to say. Uh, and also... Uh, we need to become more productive. A lot of the most productive farms defined properly are the best run farms. And actually, some of the farms, you know, people say when you want to become more productive, some of the farms that are the least productive are also the most destructive. So we need to improve productivity. So we set uh, a set of targets um, about this is what a good food system would look like. And actually, it needs to change quite a lot. We need to eat about 30% more fruit and veg than we do today, 50% more fiber, reduce uh, foods that are high in fat, salt, and sugar by 25%, and reduce meat eating by about 30%. And we then set out the ways in which you could tackle those two feedback loops, the junk food cycle uh, and the invisibility of nature. And we had various policies against uh, four objectives. One, which was to escape the junk food cycle. And there we said you have to intervene in the commercial mechanism, and we recommended uh, a sugar and salt reformulation tax, which would minimize the increase in cost of food and maximize the amount of reformulation, along with improvements in education. We recommended that while food poverty is just poverty and is not the job of the food system to deal with poverty, that's kind of a huge issue, which I'm not in my pay grade to deal with about how you make society less unequal and how you bring people out of poverty. But there are specific things that you can do to support the diets of those who are really struggling. Um, giving food to children who are struggling during the holidays, uh, increasing access to free school meals, increasing Healthy Start, which is a system of providing fruit and veg and other healthy meals to people who are struggling with young families. Thirdly, make the best use of our land. So we said that the government needs to set out a land use framework, it needs to decide before it goes ab uh, about elms and doing the future farming, you can't say how much should go into sustainable farming initiative, landscape recovery, and uh, sorry, na a local nature recovery and landscape recovery, unless you actually have a strategic view on what land you've got and how to use it. And once they've done that, I actually think that the government's uh, current position is going in the right direction. There are all sorts of ways in which it could slip up but I'm much more optimistic on environment than I am on health. And then finally, we said, you're not going to get long-term change unless you change the food culture. And there were uh, initiatives on statutory measures, food procurement, to make that happen. So where are we now? Funnily enough, the, the, the government responded to my work with a white paper on last Monday, this Monday, last Monday. Um, it was actually the third response uh, it had made, which shows you actually how government isn't quite joined up. So in last year, Marcus Rashford uh, 
campaigned for some of my recommendations, and those were made law. So we now have a holiday activity and food program for children on free school meals. I've been involved in that in Hackney. It's fantastic. The feedback reports that the, the assessment hasn't been done yet, but I hear it's very, very good across the country. So we will hopefully be using our schools to help children for good now. Uh, and there were increases to Healthy Start. We then had the Leveling Up white paper in January, where my education recommendations were put in place, and um, a, a program of trials on a community level to see if we can improve food, food, food environments at a community level was also uh, put in place. We then had the uh, Monday's white paper, and uh, in Monday's white paper it, said, paper, it said all the health stuff will be put down the line into the Health Secretary's Health Disparities white paper, which will be out in a few weeks. So where does that leave us and where does that leave you? And I'm talking to you who are here, who are people who, in particular, who are uh, trying in very difficult circumstances to navigate um, the Future Farming Programme and think about what this transition means to you. In terms of where we are in a kind of government sense, I think on environment, there were two big announcements uh, and some smaller ones on Monday. One was that they will do a land use framework. They'll be the first country in the world to do that. It will be incredibly political and very difficult for them to land, but it is fundamentally necessary if you're going to resolve these problems. And they also said they were going to start trying to set more of the data free so that uh, farmers, producers could actually begin to understand really how the, the system works in the data program. They didn't deal with trade. So interestingly enough, in the leaked white paper last Saturday, the government had much stronger wording on trade, saying that they would uh, introduce different standards for different levels of environmental production and animal welfare. That disappeared by the time it was published, presumably taken out by the Department for International Trade. That is a big issue still to be resolved. And nothing was in there on a statutory basis. So my fear is that it will, the kind of government will disperse and someone will have to come and do this work again in five, ten years' time. On health, we wait and see uh, what the health secretary says in a few weeks' time. My hope is that at a minimum, he will recognize that the junk food cycle exists and the food companies can't uh, do this alone. They need intervention because they know they need intervention. It'll be interesting to see where he comes out on that. In terms of people in this room, the thing I, in my other role as a non-exec at DEFRA I hear a lot is um, uh, concerns about not really being able to see into the future, not knowing enough about where the landing point is in terms of the future farming program. And I, I'm, I'm actually chairing a, a session with the Secretary of State and some others tomorrow, and I imagine that question will come up to him. I think in, in looking inside is very difficult. It is a huge transition, and DEFRA will make mistakes. I think that genuinely their, their intention is the right one. And my biggest concern at the moment is that nervousness leads to lobbying for a basic payment, to return to the system of basic payments. We don't prove that the payments for common goods can work quickly enough and you end up with Treasury taking away the cash. So I think that uh, I would like to see farmers doing, doing two. I, I don't see anyone, which I think is essential, saying this is how much money we need. Nature NGOs, uh, farming bodies, at the moment, it's just accepted that the amount that the common agricultural policy was uh, will be the amount that is required for nature. It could be much more. It could be less. No one is making that case. And Treasury will be very interested in that case when they come to reviewing this. And the second is proving that um, basic payments, uh, sorry, proving that you can pay, you can get in, in, uh, public goods from that money. Because if you can't show that, it will be seen as, as they see the common agricultural policy, a lot of money to Dyson uh, not to produce food, but to, to make his estate look nice. Uh, and both those cases lead to a reduction in the money. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there. Um, I would, I'm a, I've seen a number of people who I'd love to speak to on that second point, Mark and various others, but I think that is really, I'd love to see the farming body leaning in to how we can make the environmental uh, program work rather than arguing for basic payments, because I think that way you lead to double disaster, you lead to no recovery of nature, and you lead to all the money being taken away from the farming community. Um, but I am fundamentally optimistic 
uh, particularly on environment. So thank you very much for inviting me in this incredibly hot tent and bearing with me. <laughs> I, I feel that I'm getting your... Um, I feel that I'm getting all the wind coming from your various programs coming in this direction. Well done, um, I don't, I'm not going to waste any time asking my questions, because there are many more questions here. So th there's a mic going round, is that right? OK. Could you say who you are before the question? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Tom Allen Stevens, Oxfordshire Farmer. I lead the British On Farm Innovation Network. Uh, Henry, thank you very much for that talk and, and, and for all the work that you've done as well. It, it is fantastic. Um, one element that I want to uh, raise is, uh, it's a very small part of your report, but it's on farmer-led innovation. Um, and thank you very much for your recommendations as far as that's concerned, uh, especially in terms of the funding um, and the structures that you're suggesting to set up within that. Um, now, within Boffin, we're very lucky to be able to see some most fantastic jaw-dropping innovations uh, in our research centers around the country and in glass houses mainly. Um, within the network, we've got the most fantastic farmers, scientists, uh, and knowledge exchange managers uh, who are coming out with brilliant ideas about how to bring those innovations out into the field um, uh, and, and, and onto the farm. What's lacking is the funding. And I'm getting so fed up with ministers uh, telling us that they're putting money into farmer-led innovation when that money is not coming through. It's not coming through to the coalface, to us who are at the coalface of innovation. And I'm sure there are plenty of farmers sitting here today who have tried to go for this funding that is supposed to be there, and it's just not happening. So first of all, I want to ask you, how important do you think this area is? And secondly, what can we do to release that money? So... Uh, on the first of those two things, it is essential, and it's a set, you know, th th there are, I think there are th kind of th three forms of innovation that's required. There's the stuff that money normally goes on, which is the really technical stuff. You know, most innovation money has gone on genetics for the last 30 years, and that needs to continue to happen. There is farm-led innovation. I'm really interested in why that's not happening. So I know that in UKRI, for example, the story that Ostalene Lacer tells as part of how they want these things to work, they're fed up with innovation being led by universities, and they almost want it to be a prerequisite that people in the system are a part of it. Uh, and they've got increasing amount of money going into this area. And then the third area of innovation, actually, I think, is there's a lot of work to be done on how do we spread the, the differences that you see between good practice and less good practice are so huge that without one more scientific breakthrough, if you manage to spread the word about what's working well, you could radically improve the system, productivity and uh, productivity in true terms, without any new technology. So I think it's critical. Um, in terms of what you can do, I'm really interested to hear it's not happening. So um, I had thought with the UKRI money and the, uh, and the recent money that's been announced in farming that was happening. Um, I'm interested that you know. You're not being listened to. I mean, the first, I, I can try and find out what's happening if you write to me, because that's my job is to, as a non-executive, it's to check that the things that people say are happening are happening. Um, but that's the first I've heard of that particular problem. And also, I'm surprised it's that hard because you're clearly incredibly pissed off about it. So, um, <laughs> I'm surprised it hasn't it hasn't bubbled up sooner. But uh, let's, why don't we talk after this? I'm curious about what, how you've reached out to the government to say this isn't happening, I and mean, what response you've got. Well, just to give you an example, the research starter projects, which I don't know, there may be farmers in, uh, gathered here today who are um, uh, uh, going for the research starter projects. Uh, so my members have put in three uh, examples uh, of that, um, uh, which link through to research that's coming through um, uh, and we've been told it's outside the scope. We have to wait for the accelerating adoption package. Uh, now, the accelerating adoption package, as you may be aware, Henry, uh, was supposed to start this autumn. The discussions haven't even begun yet. Yeah. They haven't even begun. So how far away is that accelerating adoption? We're going to miss another harvest and another harvest, um, and that work still isn't going to be done. And we're not going to get the innovation out onto farm. 
I mean, as a starting point, if you come to the Secretary of State's panel at the Conservative Environment Network tomorrow, I'll ma I'm, I'm chairing it, so I'll make sure you can ask him the question, because he'll know better than me. <laughs> Um, hello, uh, Stephen Jacobs, Organic Farmers and Growers. I've got a couple of questions. Brilliant talk, Henry. You nail it so well and sort of encapsulate things that other people find they have to write huge vote volumes on. One of the questions is, how can we in the organic sector work better with everybody else? Because We've got farmers, we certify more than half the UK's organic land. We've got farmers who've been farming for 20 plus years. It's really bumpy, the first bit into organic. So they need support, whatever you do, even if it's not organic, but you do something more agroecological. And the support you need needs to be consistent, which we haven't seen, I echo what Tom's saying. The other question, Innovation, I don't necessarily think innovation per se is wrong, but I would like to see innovation in economic models. We've got a system at the moment, it's fine that a supermarket business can compete with another one by raising their share capital and increasing their profitability. They want to attract investment, of course they do. But the people here are not attracting investment but they're the primary producers, you quite rightly point out, are producing food in this country. So if we're going to address nature crisis, climate crisis, uh, the rural economy, uh, how are we going to get dietary related ill health sorted whilst those manufacturing businesses yours, you speak of, and I understand some of them feel trapped, are still profiting and able to profit, and that's fine, those are the rules but they're still profiting and not investing back into the farmers who, who provide the food in the first place. So the, uh, two questions. So in terms of how do you, the first thing of how do you spread the knowledge, how do you help people? I mean, you probably have a better sense of that, to be honest, than I do. The thing that I, that I see more now than when I started and seems to be accelerating very quickly are farmer clusters working together, sharing knowledge, measuring each other's soils, sharing techniques, you know, organic farmers sharing techniques with conventional arable farmers in the same area. And I think that, you know, we as a, as a for various reasons, we have a country, our farmers have been more resistant to that kind of behavior than on the continent. And I think that is clearly got to be, when we're dealing with catchment size solutions, we have to have catchment size groups of farmers talking to each other. On the economic transition, if I've understood your question correctly, I'm more optimistic on the nature side than on the diet side. So if, the, the, I flicked over a slide there which showed the, the, the true cost of food. If you build in all of the dietary, the money we spend on the NHS and uh, reduced uh, productivity of our economy and all the environmental damage. And uh, when I, there were various reports that I read when I started which said the actual cost of food was twice what we paid for at the supermarket checkout. And initially, I was incredibly skeptical about that. And then um, we did a lot of work. I spoke to Parthadas Gupta about it in some length. And actually, I now think it is probably more than that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that is what the cost of a sustainable system has to be. So all of human innovation, which is an incredibly powerful thing, is at the moment aimed at producing cheap, safe food. If you give it the goal of producing cheap, safe food while restoring the environment and protecting diets, and innovation is focused in that area, you will see the cost of that coming down. You just will. So, the, so you know, if you take, for example, the energy transition, the cost of uh, solar now is plummeting, continues to plummet. And uh, Many quite sensible people think that that will, in the end, be in quite, quite quickly the, the thing that makes the energy transition. But back 15 years ago, it was much more expensive. And people said, solar's never going to be. It's too expensive. We have to have oil. The question is how you get that transition so that people can afford food as you go through it 
and you have a fair transition, you kind of, and that's very difficult to do. But I think it's possible in farming if you increase the regulatory base, pay for public goods, show where you're going and what the future's going to look like. That's possible. On health, I think it's much, much more difficult. You could have a farming system that was, they're, they're more disconnected than you think. You could have a farming system that was completely environmentally friendly and still was incredibly harmful to health. And I think the problem is much greater in health because politically, it's much easier to see a road through to changing those environmental incentives, whereas health is much more politically fraught. I'm not sure that answers your question, but. Going to someone else here. Thank you. Um, Duncan Farrington, Northamptonshire farmer and food manufacturer. And we do a very nice line of oils that we sell to restaurants. So, um, But Henry, absolutely fascinated. I'd love to see those slides again. But the question I'd like to ask is, I was involved with uh, um, Leaf a few years ago, and uh, I think his name was Carl Schumacher, an American uh, person that had come up with a way of making sure that child benefit payments were actually going to improve um, poor families' um, uh, nutrition and dietary requirements. And they, they looked at, um, as part, part of the child benefit payments, give it in food tokens that could be spent in supermarkets in America um, on any sort of food, not on alcohol, not on cigarettes. Um, the, the, the White House to start with, didn't think it would work, but then they got really behind it involved, and it turned out to be a great success because right from a young age, families were starting to learn to cook and uh, feed their children, and if this is then linked in with education on uh, nutrition and diet, um, it, it seemed to be a great success. Is there anything you think that the government here could do? Because you say that uh, um, you're, you're less positive on uh, the, the diets than you are on the environment side of the policy. Yes, so this is another area which is ideologically fraught. So there are many people who feel that giving food to people in poverty is demeaning. And this includes some of the food poverty campaigners. And actually, you should give them money, and you should give them the freedom to spend money as they, as they want. If you look at the evidence of it, it is the case that if you provide some part of those benefits in kind, then people eat better diets. And w what I concluded was that that evidence was actually more important than the ideology. And if you're already buying that food, it's effectively a money transfer. And so the government actually does do that. Healthy Start gives, uh, it was £3.50 a week, and the, as a result, my recommendation extended to £4.50. The supermarkets now mostly add a pound to that, so that's £5 and a bit a week for parents in poverty of young families or pregnant to get fruit, veg, and milk. And so that is something that happens. I think that at the moment, two things need to happen on top of that. First of all, the, the level of all these benefits, uh, free school meals and so forth, haven't gone up for a long time. We're in a, a cost of living crisis that simultaneously has made the £2.30, for example, that you get to produce a free school meal go less far and has forced more people into needing those free school meals. The government has said they're reviewing that, and I hope that they... Uh, that, they, that they do that. The second thing the government could do, the, the Community Eat Well program, which is the thing I described, uh, that, that a deal like the Department for Leveling Up have committed to doing, is based on a program in Washington that some people think is absolutely nuts, but they basically took people who were struggling, who were poor and struggling with their health, and prescribed them fruit and veg, and on top of that, took them around supermarkets, showed them how to shop, uh, help them with cooking lessons, and not only did it improve their health, it was not viewed as being paternalistic, nanny state, etc. It was viewed very positively. So whether that will work in this context is a different question, but I think there's, we can be much more creative in those kind of interventions. I'd just like to say, having lived in the United States and made programs about food stamps, that I think it is one of the things that has solidified poverty in the United States. And um, the, the people being uh, given food stamps instead of money um, is, is demeaning. And what, but what has worked in some of the worst uh, poverty-stricken areas of the United States is people being given um, vouchers to spend at markets, at farmers' markets. Um, 
But supermarkets, you just go in there, and if you, if you don't know how to cook, you, um, you buy ultra-processed food. I mean, it hasn't made any difference to health. In fact, while the, the um, food stamp system has existed, poverty and um, ill health has just got worse in the United States. Yes, next question. Yeah, hi, it's Edward Whittle from Whitby Seafoods. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, obviously not a farmer or, you know, more fishing, that's my bag. And, uh, you know, I didn't expect anything about fishing to come in there. But, you know, you mentioned of the junk food cycle and how intractable that is and how money really uh, rules a lot of this. Um, so just um, if you were to invest your money in a part of the food system now for the future, where, whereabouts would you invest? Would it? I'll leave it as broad as that. I, I am investing money, so I can tell you. I can, so, funnily enough, I mean, my country life is spent down in Devon, mostly on the water as well. And I uh, spend a lot of time in Brixham Market. I've invested in a, a seafood business down there that not only has seafood restaurants, but actually has started a business buying directly from the market, shipping around the country, because I think there is going to be a a transition to, uh, which is being very quickly accelerated by the Ukrainian war and the 35% tariff on Russian whitefish on top of the fact that 70% of our whitefish came from there, there is going to be a trend to us eating more fish and eating more of our own fish. And so even though it is a very, very tough time to be in the fishing business, I have long term, I'm quite optimistic about that. Um, and then generally the other investments that I'm personally making are towards uh, non-meat things that aren't, that are non-meat by accident rather than shouting at you for it. So things that just taste great uh, and that enable, mostly actually it's slightly at the lower end. So I think you're gonna see as the price of meat increases and people want to eat healthily, I think there is a need for and money to be made in making it easy for people to eat vegetables rather than having to be otolengi. I mean, my, my, um, my, my daughter uh, is, I've got a son who um, eats everything and then a middle son who is like a kind of uh, uh, hunter-gatherer. He eats meat and, veg and fruit and that's it. And then my daughter is vegetarian. And I, I trained as a chef. I worked in a Michelin style restaurant, I'm a pretty good cook. And I actually find, found it, that original transition, every day cooking veg, quite challenging. And I'm quick, and I kind of know what I'm doing. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done helping people eat cheaply and healthily um, without really shouting about it, making, making it the more, the, the, the more attractive option rather than the sad option. OK, it's hard to tell who's asking. The, oh, oh, good. OK, good, thanks. Hi there, um, I'm Tom Clark. I'm a farmer from the Cambridge Fens. Um, Henry, uh, thinking about your recommendation about a land use strategy that the government's going to produce, I, I think I'm farming probably in a state of triple whammy because uh, I, with some of the most productive farm land in, in the country, uh, the, fe the Fens are seven. Uh, uh, 4% of the land area of the UK, but produce 7% of the food. And much of that is salad crops and vegetables, which we need to be eating more of, 80 to 90% of things like radishes and celery and lettuce. But we're also farming on carbon, farming on peat, basically. So it presents a massive opportunity for carbon sequestration. And of course, if it was rewilded, it would be a massively biodiverse and rich wetland. So really, it's an intractable problem. And nowhere is the, is the, the, um, the, the contest between those competing uses greater. How do we resolve a hard case like that that actually is going to be really critical on, on three levels? So first of all, to say that you're a rare example of someone who's just as handsome in the flesh as you are on your Twitter uh, picture, which I've, <laughs> which, I've, which I've seen and seen a lot. Um, so when, when you come to land use strategy, the Fens actually could, you couldn't have, as you say, a more difficult area. And the Inevitably, the government, in the way it constructs its regulation and payments, will affect what happens in the fence. So it needs to make a call on food production versus carbon sequestration versus nature restoration. F from the time I've seen the fence, my guess is you will have a bit of a patchwork. So you'll have 
uh, quite a lot of good work, which you'll know about, about how, you know, um, Dieter Helm famously said about the fence, if you took in the carbon cost, they, they would all be incredibly unprofitable, those farms. But there are some really interesting technologies in keeping that ground wet and keeping it just below the roots and stopping at least the release of, of carbon from the peat. And then I think you will see um, you know, the, the, the work that Jake Fines is doing. You'll have some areas that become, uh, that it becomes more profitable for you if they get the subsidies right to set aside for nature. Um, I, I doubt you will see any of that really productive land being complete, or, or a significant quantity of it being completely stripped out. I think that probably the, the solution, and my guess is the solution of land use strategy is minimize the release of carbon in that productive land and s soak up that, the carbon that's being lost there somewhere else. And that's a great example of why you need the strategy to be national, because you have to take a view on what you're going to do in different areas. Hello, um, my name is Sarah King. I work for Rewilding Britain, and I'm quite pleased that the last question already mentioned rewilding. Um, but we manage a network of landowners and land managers who are rewilding land, and increasingly they're having pressure put on them that we need to think about food production and food security so we don't have space to rewild. So I'd really like your thoughts on how we can make sure that we balance both. I can't, there's a, a voice just, I can't see where you are, but your voice just, at the back, hello. Um, so, there are two things that, uh, of all of the uh, debates on Twitter that particularly do my nut. Uh, one is the idea that somehow rewilding is about turning the whole of, uh, East Anglia into a, a wetland. I think rewilding Britain, even there, you know, even Guy Shrubsoll's, you know, ambition is something like 5% of our land. And given that 20% of our land produces 3% of our calories, there is uh, clearly room to do both. And the other is the fact that because of the war in Ukraine, we should continue to pay uh, farmers to produce food, which just economically the idea that you get over a, a, a food cost crisis by continuing to subsidize a tiny bit of global food production doesn't make any sense to me. So I think there is absolutely a space where you can land if you get the current payments right and the regulation right, where you can produce as much food, bring back uh, semi-wildlife, you know, you can argue about what wildlife is, to 5% or so of the land, maybe with some conservation grazing, bring a lot of wildlife back into farms, and sequester the carbon that you need to do. So I don't think, I think it's difficult to, to do the maths and, and then do the regulation and payments to get the maths right, but I don't think it's impossible. Okay, where are we in terms of questions? One way over at the back there, waving piece of paper in the air. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Andy Guy, I'm not a farmer either. I'm a sustainable food and farming consultant. Um, but my question relates to um, the food that society eats. Um, my daughter's 19, and a bit like your family, we've got a, an interesting blend of diets in our household. Um, she eats most of her food out of her house, and I think I'm right in saying that most of society eats about half of their food outside the home. Um, the movement, I'm feeling really positive about the change of people's attitude towards the food that they buy in the supermarket. Um, I think that is changing and people are becoming much more aware of the environmental and wholesome credentials of that food. But with such a large proportion of food being bought and sold through um, food outlets and pubs and restaurants and fast food places, and indeed in the public sector as well, in restaurants and in establishments like schools and hospitals, how can we as a society change that half of the food and make that healthier? Um, and what can the people in this room do to make that happen as well? It's a really, really interesting question. So I think it's about, it's, it's by value, it's, in the US it's 50%, I think in the UK by value it's about 40%, and by calories about 25%. One of the biggest issues during COVID was that you suddenly had 25% of calories that were served 
out of home, completely removed from the food system. At the same time, people started buying from corner shops rather than supermarkets. And so there was this kind of mass getting food to different places, which was, which was done, but was complicated. Um, I think on the so I was actually, yesterday I was having a discussion with one of the big um, food delivery companies about what they could do. And I think on hell, on, on environment, there's an awful lot they can do without harming their business models. So they can, you know, uh, push people towards e eating food that is slightly less uh, damaging to the environment without costing themselves a lot. They can help us just nudge us towards less meat and so forth. And they're very keen to do that because they realize the problem they've got on health. And I said, I don't think there's anything you can do on health. I really don't, you know, that market is, if you look at the advertising for it, every ad for those services is a pizza. And the Snoop Dogg ad, which my kids love, and we all dance on the sofa when it comes, do you know the Snoop Dogg ad for Just Eat? Absolutely brilliant. Obviously the wrong audience for that particular thing. <laughs> but, um, um, so it's all crap. And it's all crap because it's ordered by people who are tired and they go, I, 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 years ago I talked to, the, to, to a, a, one of the private venture capitals, people who own Burger King. And he said, Henry, the thing is, we put a, a, a photograph of a cheap burger and a salad in the window to attract people. And by the time they get to the counter, they order Whopper and a large fries. And that, that is their model, those delivery companies. That it, and they're selling mostly food that is not good for us. And not only do I think they can't change that, I think it's incredibly, I mean, kind of think it's incredibly difficult to find ways of legislating that change. So, you know, you've had this thing where actually the food bought from supermarkets was beginning to become, at least got, get less unhealthy. You can see the kind of HFSS leveling off. And then suddenly you've got this, just as you were getting somewhere, you've got this huge growth in out of home unhealthy food. And it's, it's a, I don't know the answer to how you crack the health problem. But it's interesting that in your strategy, the uh, sugar and salt tax, which, which would have addressed this, but of course that's not in the white paper. Yes, yeah, so that is, so the, the reason that we went actually to the sugar and salt tax, we said you've got to get as far back to the cause as possible, intervene there, and it would have dealt with quite a lot of that. It wouldn't have dealt with uh, f fat and carbs but it would have dealt with quite a lot. Um, and that's kind of, we think, where the landing point is. In terms of the white paper, it wasn't in there. I don't expect it to be in the health white paper because actually I think even if you had a government that had a lot of political capital to spend, I think in a cost of living crisis, it would be very, very difficult to persuade people that a tax on sugar and salt wouldn't put up the price of food but would reformulate. So it'd be very interesting to see what the health secretary comes up with in replacement of that. Will be. Um, one last question. We seem to be edging beyond three o'clock. Um, back with a hat at the. Um, actually, saying somebody, it's somebody with a hat's not very helpful, is it? <laughs> uh, Henry, I'm not really expecting you to answer this question, but I'm going to answer it, ask it anyway. Uh, given that we have a government which is completely beholden to the idea that markets provide the solution to everything, given that our Prime Minister, one of those first statements upon coming to office was to get rid of the um, sugar tax, he is even questioned tobacco tax, given the report that's just been published, given the fact that just about every expert agrees that there needs to be government intervention both on health and on the environment, isn't the change that the one that we really need to see is a change of government? So, um, I do think that the, this government has limited room to manoeuvre at the moment. Um, but I, I would say one thing, which is that the, the health thing guy is, if it was guy, it sounded like guy. Um, I really do think the health thing is changing. So there has been this view on health that in the right, in the right of the party, that freedom was about choice. It, this view of negative freedom, not being stopped from doing something. And I do think the idea of positive freedom, the idea that true freedom is the, the ability 
to be healthy and live a good life is becoming more prevalent. Winston Churchill said uh, that the strongest asset a country can have is a healthy population. And I do think the realization that it is it's telling someone with a certain gene set to go and live in the current environment and be healthy is similar to telling someone to go and swim uh, in a sewage-filled river and just swim in the clean bits. I do think that message is getting through. And I do think, you know, when Sajid Javid looks at what's going on in the health service, I do think they generally realize now that it will need government intervention. How long it then takes to get through the next step to do it, as I said, I don't think you, you need quite a lot of political capital to burn, and you could question whether this government has that. But I do think that narrative is changing. Uh, you know, pe people from all sides, really interesting, there's, there's a woman called Dolly Tice who is trying to change the, the narrative in the Conservative Party on health. And she has been, she, uh, she showed me some text she got from SPADs in government. And she was explaining that you can't, you, you need intervention, you can't expect people to live in this environment. The, the, the drive, your appetite is too strong. It's a very strong human drive and you need to make the environment better. And she showed me these messages come back saying, what you say is absolutely makes sense, but it goes against everything, you know, everything I've been taught, given that it was bad probably up until I was 19 or whatever, whatever age they are. Um, so, there, so there is a, I do think there's a real crunching of ideological gears going on. And the truth of what's happening in the NHS will just get worse and worse. So I am actually optimistic that if not this government, that narrative will change and we will get there in the end. Well, Henry Dumbleby, thank you very much. I mean, my last question, which I think I asked you for the program, was you put three years, more than three years, effort into this writing that strategy, which the government in its white paper on Monday seems to have ignored a great deal of it. Do you feel that you were, you've wasted your time? No, not so. Well, I mean, I don't. I mean, other people obviously will have to judge. But I, I came into it, I was asked it by Michael Gove, I knew that he probably wouldn't be there in, in DEFRA when it was published. And I took it on because I thought there was a job of work to be done both to change the way and fundamentally in which people understand how the system works, the narrative, and you don't get any political change unless people understand how things actually work. And then secondly, implement, recommend some policies. And I think we've actually made quite good progress on the first of those, on the narrative, particularly on, on, on health. And about 50% of what I recommended has gone in. Is that enough to bring about the change as quickly as it needs to happen? No. Is it progress? I think, yeah. Was it worth spending three years doing what I didn't have anything else to do? <laughs>